This channel is part of the History Hit Network. On a visit to Santiago in Chile, Camilla Parker Bowles, hunter of foxes and mistress of the Prince of Wales, found that she had unexpectedly become the quarry. It was a predicament well known to her late rival, Princess Diana. She was hounded and harassed wherever she went. Come on, get lost. Diana would pay a terrible price for her fame. Now the tables are turned. 6,000 miles from home, Camilla finds that she is now the center of attention. <laughs> Diana manipulated the press, but often resented unwelcome attention. For the pursued, the thrill of the chase soon lost its attraction. On holiday, Diana often needed help from officials to throw off the press. Out, O-U-T, out. Have a nice trip, ma'am. A few years later, Camilla too needed VIP protection. Camilla secretly visited her old friend Lucia Santa Cruz. Lucia introduced her to Prince Charles in the early 70s and thus began a tantalizing saga of love and betrayal. Highgrove, country home of the Prince of Wales. In July 1997, it was the setting for a lavish 50th birthday party for Camilla. Such an honor exposed her to a new level of public scrutiny. I shouldn't think Prince Charles got the slightest clue what it could possibly be like to be Camilla. How could he? Uh, the, the whole rarefied way in which he was brought up, the rarefied way in which he lives. In 1992, Camilla was revealed as Charles's mistress in a shattering book written by Andrew Morton, to whom Diana had dictated the story of her unhappy marriage. Following publication, Camilla was invited into the royal fold at a polo match. But Camilla became the most reviled woman in Britain. Camilla has a, a thankless role to play. It's, um, one has, he, has to have huge sympathy for this, uh, for this woman because she's always going to bask in Diana's shadow. She's always going to be seen as the wicked stepmother figure of fairy tales. Therefore, that's a very, very difficult image to change when you come to public acceptance. Charles met Camilla at a polo match when they were both single. Polo, a sport for the wealthy, had an appeal for seductive girls, as well as for officers and gentlemen. Charles would fill in his diary with polo fixtures before his public duties. He enjoyed the physical thrill of the game. It was the perfect social environment for a prince used to having his own way until the tragedy of his divorce and Diana's death forced him to review his life. What has changed Charles fundamentally, actually, is Diana's death. I think he is an enormously changed man. I think that's thrown him into an incredible state of the soul. I mean, he's analyzing the mistakes he's made. He's taking on the grief of his sons. He's feeling all the guilt about what he did. Those are, that's huge baggage. The birth of their sons, William in 1982 and Harry two years later, added the demands of parenthood to a failing marriage. Shortly after this Majorcan holiday with the Spanish royal family in 1986, Charles went off alone to Balmoral and to his mistress Camilla. Keeping up the false image of a happy family placed a great strain on Diana. In 1987, they were apart for three months Charles ignored press reports until the Queen intervened. He blamed the chill in the marriage on Diana's illness. That was Charles's, Charles's great downfall, was, but was the belief that he, he could actually put out one, kind of his, uh, one uh, view of his character, that this was the man who was the loving, caring man, nursing the wife through a, a very difficult period of time, when in fact the truth was totally different, and he actually believed that he could get away with it. Diana was told to conceal the marriage rift for the sake of queen and country. Charles, too, pretended all was well. I'm quite sure that, as in the past has happened, and this is a history of the royal family going back two, three hundred years, that uh, the uh, prince was expected uh, to have a mistress. 
what happened, I think, with uh, Diana was that she said, no, to hell with this, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to uh, lay down under uh, Camilla or indeed lay down under Charles. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be somebody who's my own woman, and if he's going to do that sort of thing, I'm going to fight back. Quite right too. My father was at that house. In 1990, on their first royal visit to Hungary, recently liberated from communism, Diana was already contemplating revenge against her husband. After the Morton book, where Diana had expressed her um, worries about the relationship of um, uh, Charles and Camilla that he knew perfectly well that all the Panis spin doctors had been saying that there wasn't anything at all and this was all part of Diana's fantasy. Well, they couldn't possibly have said that without his knowledge and approval. For him then to come out and say he had done, it was more than hypocrisy. I mean, it was an inhuman thing to say about your wife, who clearly was under very considerable stress o over this marriage. And you just say, well, it's nonsense. She's not very well, you know. It is 300 years of arrogant inbreeding and getting your own way that created that. Because I don't think he's a bad man, but I do think that he's a man who's just been brought up in a tradition which we are no longer prepared to accept as something that is realistic. Charles believed he was the heir not just to the House of Windsor, but to a thousand years of monarchy. His position and royal upbringing set him apart. Waiting for the throne isolated him further. His destiny was dictated by a family tradition begun by Queen Victoria and continued by her grandson, George V. What happened, though, in the beginning of the 20th century uh, with George V and Queen Mary was that there was a decision, I think quite deliberately taken by George V, that the monarchy should adapt itself to democracy. What we're going to do, we're going to symbolise the one thing that all our people have in common. Now, the thing that everybody had in common in the, until the 1960s was family. You all belong to a family, you were a product of a family, you were all going to get married, very few people didn't get married and so on. And the House of Windsor did this, and it did it extraordinarily successfully. George V and Queen Mary, and later on George VI and Queen Elizabeth, now the Queen Mother, very, very successfully embodied typical middle-class bourgeois family values. It was a bourgeois monarchy. <laughs> But some of the children rebelled, notably the eldest son, Edward, the Prince of Wales. He defied his parents' family values with a string of married mistresses. There was Thelma Furness and Frieda Dudley Ward and Wallace Simpson, for whom he gave up the throne. Now, there are always exceptions. There was the exception, of course, of Edward VIII, who was driven from the throne because he wouldn't fulfil this particular set of values. He would not fulfill this image of the family monarchy. But the trouble is, you see, once you set yourself that standard, if you then veer from it, you suffer and you suffer terribly. Behind a facade of pomp and pageantry, the royal family tried to conceal its internal divisions and the behavior of its more wayward members. They might have decided from the 1960s, well, why don't we admit that the family is no longer as powerful a symbol as it used to be? You know, that divorce rates are increasing, there are more broken homes, there are more illegitimate children. Let's sort of shift the image a little bit. And they didn't. What they did instead, they constantly hyped it. They hyped it within the royal family. They hyped it supremely, of course, with the marriage of Charles and Diana. Their marriage was sold as a fairy tale was perceived to have said, we are morally virtuous. And then its conduct was discovered not to be morally virtuous. And that charge of hypocrisy was thrown at it and it has stuck and they will find it very difficult to get rid of it. Camilla was also following a family tradition of a special type of royal service. Her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, had been King Edward's mistress. She was a very vivacious, very attractive, very charming woman, very sensuous kind of woman. There was Italian blood in her family. And um, so in a way, she caught his eye and uh, he never really looked back. He was very taken with her. She was the perfect king's mistress. King Edward VII was a very restless, very difficult man. She knew exactly how to handle him. So she was, as I say, the perfect mistress for a king, for a man like him. Edward VII 
you know, the man with, with so many mistresses that there were allegedly sort of rules as to how the mistress should behave. And uh, one of them sort of explained how a mistress was supposed to behave, uh, that you curtsied first, called him sir, and then jumped into bed. Uh, you know, there was actually a sort of court etiquette uh, for the mistress. In those days, there was no scandal about that kind of thing. The general public didn't know about it at all. If photographs of them appeared in British newspapers, then her face would be airbrushed out. You would see her hat, you would see her dress, but you wouldn't actually see who it was. So in that way, the newspapers were very discreet about it. Alice Keppel played the perfect wife, but rumours surrounded the birth of her second child. There were two daughters. There was Violet and there was Sonia. And uh, as the second daughter, Sonia, was born after Alice Keppel had met the then Prince of Wales, it's quite likely that, that he was her father. No one can know this kind of thing for sure. But I think it is more than likely that um, the future King Edward VII was Sonia Keppel's father. If true, then Sonia passed on royal blood to her granddaughter, Camilla. Born in 1947, the year Alice Keppel died, Camilla was the first child of Sonia's daughter, Rosalind, and Major Bruce Shand. Unlike Charles, Camilla had a happy childhood with her parents, sister and brother. They lived the charmed life of the country set in their comfortable former rectory, The Lanes, near Lewis in Sussex. Camilla enjoyed ponies, parties and fun in the swimming pool. After attending a local preparatory school, Camilla completed her education at the elite Queensgate School in Kensington. Like many of her classmates, Camilla became a debutante in search of a wealthy and important husband. Her eventual marriage to a courtier would bring her close to the royal circle and especially close to Prince Charles. The Prince of Wales was then a young bachelor searching for a bride. He could not confide in his parents and needed an older and wiser figure to be his soulmate. His great uncle, Lord Mountbatten, filled that role. In 1977, Royal Jubilee year, the Queen and Prince Philip were occupied with royal duties. Mountbatten took the opportunity to guide the young prince. Charles often visited Broadlands, Mountbatten's Hampshire home. His granddaughter, Amanda Natchbull, was considered a potential royal bride. Davina Sheffield was another of Charles's girlfriends. He was also linked with actress Susan George and the aristocratic Lady Jane Wellesley. There was no shortage of girlfriends, including Sabrina Guinness. But Lady Tryon, Kanga, was a married confidant who became a rival to Camilla. In fact, several married women became involved with Charles, but Camilla occupied a special place in his heart. She was more than a lover, giving him the comfort and warmth he had been denied in childhood. Charles and Camilla began their long affair in October 1972 after an evening out at the exclusive London club Annabelle's in the heart of Mayfair. Camilla was a wealthy girl about town. She enjoyed all the freedom of a young liberated woman of the 60s. She was already experienced with men. One of the most famous romances in history started in an unremarkable block of flats in Stackhouse on Cundy Street, where Camilla lived at the time. At Broadlands, the sophisticated Camilla was enchanted by the immature young prince. Charles, said society diarist Roy Strong, was earnest with a boyish grin and a non-sophisticated sense of humour, prankish, thoughtful, kind and shy. He began a naval career that would complete his formal education and take him away from the girl he loved. He would be thousands of miles from home on the high seas as a serving officer when he heard that Camilla was engaged to Andrew Parker Bowles. They had a high society wedding in July 1973. Camilla had won the most handsome man in her social sphere. Charles feared he had lost her forever. Really, the big mistake was not to have married her in the first place. That, of course, has been his life all the way through. He's, he's, um, he's not been able to make up his own mind. He's dallied and dithered, listened to the Duke of Edinburgh. Disaster for anybody, I would have thought. No other human being lives like that, and, uh, and unfortunately, it was his undoing very early on. Should have married her then. The Parker Bowles lived at Bollyhide Manor in Wiltshire. To be close by, Charles bought Highgrove. Under the cover of royal engagements, Camilla turned up regularly. 
Charles's relationship with a married woman was acceptable in royal circles. Charles and Camilla also met at Hall Place, the Hampshire home of Camilla's grandmother Sonia, the probable daughter of Edward VII. Enter now Charles's innocent fiancée, Lady Diana Spencer. She knew nothing at first of his secret life. An inexperienced 19-year-old, Diana had accepted Camilla's friendship at face value. No one would tell her the truth. The royal family and her own relatives remained silent about Charles's mistress. As her relationship with Charles progressed, Diana grew suspicious of Camilla's influence over him. Charles left for a pre-arranged tour of Australia shortly after their engagement in 1981. Diana's distress was passed off as the anxiety of a young girl facing the absence of her future husband. However, the awful truth was beginning to intrude on her happiness. Diana had heard Charles take a last-minute phone call from Camilla before they left his office in Buckingham Palace. Knowing that Camilla was in constant contact with Charles, Diana's tears fell as his plane took off. In Australia, Charles and Camilla's calls were bugged. The incident was dismissed as a hoax. But the press were suspicious. When Charles entertained a blonde, assumed to be Diana, on the royal train in sidings near the Parker Bowles home, it made the front page news. There were official denials over Diana's presence. She knew it wasn't her and must have suspected the woman was Camilla. Diana's love for Charles blinded her to reality. And in July 1981, Charles and Diana were married at the wedding of the century. Diana was the most beautiful bride you could ever imagine, said a commentator. But Diana knew Charles's secret. Few noticed the mounted escort, Camilla's husband, Andrew Parker Bowles, head of the Royal Household Cavalry. An officer and a gentleman, his discretion was assured. After two nights at Broadlands, Charles's former love nest, the newlyweds honeymooned on Britannia. Charles took with him souvenirs of Camilla. The time of the honeymoon was both a romantic time, but it was also a time of uh, extreme bitterness and, and painful memories. Uh, there was one occasion on the Royal Yacht Britannia where she opened Charles's diaries and two pictures of Camilla fluttered to the floor. Diana later informed Morton, her biographer, that she had suffered dreadfully from bulimia on her honeymoon cruise. She blamed Charles's infatuation with his mistress. Diana's obsession with Camilla grew to the point of psychological illness. At Balmoral later that summer, Diana hid her mental state from the cameras. She knew her husband could not give her the love she craved and that he would always hunger for the woman he could not have. Prince Charles has a really very interesting chart because everything you look at in regard to women and relationships says, I want what I can't have. I have this romantic dream and that I want what's just out of reach. Again, he shares that with a lot of men. He's not very different there. <clears throat> so it may be that had Camilla been the wife, that he would have naturally looked for something that would give him just that extra sense of if only I could have this person, then my life would be perfect. What is fascinating is that um, it's Camilla's sun and her, v and her moon, the two very key components in, a, in an astrological chart, are in exactly the same sign as Diana. So, I mean, you have some very similar connections from chart to chart. So I often felt that had he married Camilla, Diana might have been the great love of his life. The Queen did not invite Camilla to Balmoral, her home in Scotland. It was left to Charles's grandmother, the Queen Mother, to entertain Camilla and her husband at her home at Burke Hall, a convenient location close by for Charles and Camilla to meet. Diana believed that she had allowed a special telephone line to be installed so that Charles could phone Camilla without fear of being bugged. In time, Diana grew to distrust and dislike the Queen Mother. Outwardly, for the Prince and Princess of Wales, the royal show went on. Their dancing displays enchanted Australians, first in 1983 and in 1985 when Diana stunned onlookers by wearing a royal heirloom as a jewelled headband. And again in 1988. 
Later, Charles returned home to Camilla and the more traditional role of a prince with a mistress. I think Charles's problem is that he appeared early on to be a very new age, modern man, in touch with the values of his own generation. As he's grown older, it's become clearer that he's actually a very traditional royal. And in this department, he's a very traditional royal in that he famously said to Diana, do you expect me to be the first Prince of Wales in history not to have a mistress? When she started kicking up a fuss about Camilla, Diana turned out to be not the brainless bimbo that he thought he'd married, but a thoroughly modern woman who stamped her foot publicly and became a potent icon for feminists suddenly, but also a rather traditional woman in that she wanted a strong family unit with strong family values. He was betraying both those things. And I think as the first Prince of Wales to grow up in the mass media age, the intrusive age, he's not just out of touch with his own times, he always has been, but he's trying to live an impossible contradiction in an age when you just can't get away with that. So I don't think the deception would be any easier now in an age when people openly live with people who are not their wives. Only one of those people wants to be head of the Church of England, that's Prince Charles, and he has to live by those rules. Before Prince Andrew's wedding to Sarah Ferguson in 1986, Charles dismissed Diana's bodyguard for falling in love with his wife. Yet he and Camilla were having a full-blown affair. Royal rejoicing hid the family's concern. Charles and Diana hardly spoke during the entire wedding celebrations and came out of Buckingham Palace separately to wave off the Yorks. Holding page boy William, Diana knew that Charles was lost to her. Behind the joy for her friend Fergie, now a royal bride, Diana was already consulting astrologer Penny Thornton as she feared for her own future. She suspected Charles met Camilla in France, Spain, Turkey, Switzerland and in Italy. Florence was where Diana believed Charles and Camilla revisited royal history at her great-grandmother Alice Keppel's secret villa, a gift from King Edward VII. Camilla took art lessons to share Charles's passion for painting. She encouraged him. He took pride in his results. It was an ideal partnership. Maybe if Charles and Camilla were to go on, um, not being able to live openly together, but seeing each other most of the time and having periods of absence from each other, they would be able to sustain this very satisfactorily for them both. They, they would always have this rather romantic, passionate edge to the relationship. At a birthday party for Camilla's sister held at Ormley Lodge, home of Lady Annabel Goldsmith, Diana confronted her rival. He expected to go on his own. Diana insisted on coming and they went in the car together and she remembers him as being very uncomfortable. And so she confronted Camilla, she asked her about, about the relationship. Camilla was evasive and from that moment onwards, all Charles's friends and the, what she called dismissively the Highgrove set continued to uh, perpetuate this lie that Charles and Camilla were just friends. In June 1990, the dangers of polo were evident when the prince, an enthusiastic player, fell heavily sustaining a badly broken arm that needed surgery. Nothing as well as that. There you go. Diana continued the charade of the caring wife, visiting her husband in hospital and taking him home to recuperate at Highgrove. Once there, Diana left and Camilla nursed Charles. The broken bone refused to heal and caused Charles such pain that another operation was necessary. A specialist had to reset the injured arm. Camilla secretly visited Charles in hospital. Diana spent much of her time at the hospital meeting other patients, but afterwards she repeated the practice performance of a dutiful wife, aware that the cameras were clicking and the press were covering Charles's departure. Concealing a sham marriage in which Camilla was the third party, they went home. Camilla would enter through Highgrove's gardens the moment Diana had gone. Diana lost her home as well as her husband to Camilla. I mean, I think a lot of uh, people who not only cared about Diana, but cared about the whole notion of the royal family being able to choose a 19-year-old bride for the future king and have her 
uh, give birth to his children and then be so unceremoniously dumped and have her heart broken. In, a, in some ways, we understand why Prince Charles did what he did. He had to have a wife, he had to have children, he couldn't have the woman he wanted. But she, Camilla, she was, you know, a country housewife bringing up her children. She's the one who should have stepped aside and said, oh no, um, I can't do this to this girl. I can't do this, you know, because I'm decent and human and I can't watch this girl uh, suffering and becoming suicidal and mentally unstable and ruin her life and her children's life. Um, Camille is the one who should have stepped aside. Eventually, servants revealed details of Charles's conduct. Camilla had destroyed the fairy tale. Royal mistresses are exceedingly unpopular. There have been some popular royal mistresses, but it's very, very, they're very, very rare. Royal mistresses are unpopular first, first because they're marriage breakers. And certainly, most women in a population will always side against somebody who is seen as a marriage breaker. Diana had an affair with guards officer James Hewitt over a period of five years. She fantasised about breaking free from her marriage, but at that stage it was an impossible dream. There were other loves too, possibly seven during her lifetime, all hidden beneath a veneer of duty. Diana took her public position seriously. She performed the traditional roles like being Colonel-in-Chief of the Royal Hampshire Regiment with grace and with a smile. She was the ideal choice as Princess of Wales and future Queen. Diana delighted in criticisms of Camilla, who was older, badly groomed and much less attractive than herself. When you see her in the flesh, she, she does have something special. She's got strong features. She may not be a conventional beauty. The great endearing thing about her is she doesn't care anyway. You know, she's got a fag on and she's uh, got her hair all funny, like a stabbed sofa look, and then she's got her wellies on. I mean, one tabloid newspaper recently put a picture of Camilla beside a horse and said, which one would you rather marry? Um, or which one would you rather go to bed with? Uh, she has had to put up with some brutal publicity. I was in America once and saw a television show where someone described her as looking like a bag full of spanners, which baffled the Americans because they don't have spanners over there. But Anyway, she has had to put up with some pretty gross insults about her looks. I think Charles himself is quite sloppy in his personal habits. He's very bad with paperwork, but of course he has a support system. He has two valets paid for by the state to clean up his clothes after him and wash his socks and make sure he's got clean underpants every day and help him get dressed in the mornings. So maybe he quite likes, uh, amid the formal world in which he lives, this kind of informality that she brings to his life. Charles and Camilla enjoyed secret rendezvous all over Britain. They regularly met at country houses such as Garraby Hall in Yorkshire, home of the Earl of Halifax. Eton Hall, the Cheshire estate of the Dowager Duchess of Westminster, was another. A familiar retreat was Northmoor, then the Norfolk stud farm of Hugh and Emily Van Cutsum. Close friends protected the couple's privacy. The famously elegant stately home of the Earl and Countess of Shelburne, Bowood, was a favourite meeting place. Earl Shelburne challenged newspaper reports of their visits to protect Charles. Psychologically, it's very important to have a group of friends who will see you as a couple and acknowledge you as a couple and give you not just the emotional and psychological support, but also lend perhaps homes and opportunities where everything can be kept in its concealed situation, primarily so as not to upset anyone else. It's not so, dis so much deceitful as protective, I think. Behind the fences of Camilla's home, Middlewick House, Charles was a regular visitor. On one occasion, the press got wind that the heir to the throne was staying over. Huddled under rugs in the back seat of a chauffeur-driven car, Prince of Darkness was forced to experience the indignity of a hasty escape into the night. Impervious to this kind of evidence, Charles's office continued to undermine Diana's credibility. We were being told that uh, Charles and Diana were trying to get their life back together again. And this was after the Andrew Morton book had first revealed uh, Diana's worries about Camilla and before the actual breakup. So they were due to go on a royal tour of Korea. 
and uh, we were asked to hold off any kind of criticism of Charles and Diana. Meanwhile, the spin doctors at the palace were saying that Charles was trying to help Diana through this very difficult period of time that she was having and that uh, all this uh, uh, fantasy that she was having about Camilla being uh, Charles's mistress was subject with the problem of her illness and her bulimia. So they were all bad-mouthing her like mad. A scheduled royal visit to Korea in early November 1992 went ahead, but the tour was a mistake. The couple offended their hosts with their personal animosity towards one another. Quite simply, Charles and Diana could not stand each other's presence. It was the most disastrous public relations exercise, and it was quite clear that the two loathed each other. I mean, you only had to look at the pictures, and they were called the glums and all sorts of awful things. The poisonous atmosphere between the couple meant that they were never allowed to represent Britain abroad again. The rift between them was now beyond repair and disguise. We decided that the time was to come out and say that this is actually the truth of this relationship, that uh, all the bad mouthing of Diana and the alleged fantasy of Camilla, she was in fact true, was, was in fact true, and that she was right and that the palace were putting out the most terrible smokescreen. Um, no doubt they, they didn't believe it, but um, that uh, Charles, in fact, had been doing all the things that Diana said. The Mirror newspaper exposed the story of a taped telephone call between Charles and Camilla made in 1989. It pretty quickly became clear that this was indeed Charles and Camilla. It was what the person who brought it to us said it was. I thought that it was actually a, a very good imitation of a caricature of the Prince of Wales, uh, which indeed it was, because he was caricaturing himself. The couple talked in intimate language and made private jokes that showed Charles had a schoolboy mentality. People have not forgotten that appalling thing about wanting to come back as a Tampax. Uh, that's going to stick to him like various aspects of the Le Monica Lewinsky affair will always stick to Clinton. I think there's a lot of parallels between Charles and the Clinton episode. Uh, the President of the United States, like the future king, who's also going to be head of the church, is supposed to and expected to set some kind of moral example. Um, and both of them have suffered enormously on that front. They've both been sorely embarrassed by publication of transcripts, of very seedy, seamy tapes. In Charles's case, it's something that he's going to find very hard to shed. Oh, I thought it was so much a year of it. Outwardly, nothing changed at Middlewick House, but Camilla's secrets continued to unravel in the press. It seemed such an invasion of privacy, but it was quite clear that these two had a tremendously sexy and passionate relationship and that um, she was able to touch those parts of Charles that perhaps other people hadn't been able to reach, which is his mind, his eroticism and all that kind of thing. So they clearly have a very, very strong physical sexual base and that's a, you know, a wonderful factor for, and an enduring factor for a long-term relationship. Diana feared that she would be divorced against her wishes and lose her children to the royal family. She took the unwise step of going public in a shattering television interview. She confessed to an affair with Major James Hewitt, but blamed Camilla for the breakdown of her marriage. Although Charles had spent a lifetime dictated by duty and ceremony, he too had destroyed the mystique of the monarchy in revelations to his biographer Jonathan Dimbleby, televised in 1994. He admitted adultery with Camilla. He answered truthfully about the adultery. Now, the immediate reaction was very, well done him, this is very brave of him to admit his adultery. It wasn't anything of the sort because it, it unleashed all those demons of the lies that had gone before. 
In retrospect, Charles's confession of adultery on the Dimbleby program in 1994 was the biggest mistake he's ever made. It's quite ironic because Diana actually benefited from being honest and making honest confessions, and people loved her for her faults as much as her strengths. When Charles tried the same tactic of being honest, it just rebounded on him hugely. And of course, he didn't think at all about what impact this would have on his own children, let alone the Parker Bowles children. All sorts of people were involved who he didn't think of. That moment, of course, precipitated the eventual divorce uh, between the Parker Bowleses. Andrew Parker Bowles had put up for 20 years with the prince uh, having an affair with his wife because he thought it was his national duty, I think, to do so. But that was the last straw for him, Charles making this so public. Did he think of Andrew Parker Bowles' reaction when he gave that interview? I don't think so, but the divorce proceedings followed very hard upon. Although a Catholic, Andrew Parker Bowles remarried soon after his divorce came through. His new wife, Rosemary, enjoys invitations to Royal Ascot and visits to royal homes. Now divorced Camilla, with the help of Charles's good friend, Lord Halifax, bought a new country home, Raymill House, 10 miles from Highgrove. Charles redesigned the garden, set in 17 acres. Camilla fell in love with the Wiltshire Mansion's ornate rooms, its antique furniture and the king-size canopied bed. At the time of his divorce in 1996, Charles and Camilla were secretly photographed together at the Welsh home of their friends Nick and Suki Paravicini. The press had been tipped off by a mystery woman. In June 1997, Camilla crashed her car driving to Highgrove to meet Charles. She escaped prosecution, which led to accusations of special treatment because of her status as a royal mistress. I know that Prince Charles um, has advised her, which is the same as instructing her, not to read about herself in the newspapers, because if you read about yourself, you're going to get hurt. And um, that seems typical of their relationship, actually. This is the way we do it, I don't do this, and then you won't have to read that. And uh, I'm sure that she respects that, because she respects most of the things he says. <laughs> When Camilla asked the newly engaged Diana if she intended to hunt, the princess suspected that Charles and Camilla secretly met through the hunting fraternity. Camilla is at her best on horseback, showing the humorous side of her personality that Charles loves. I think the fact that um, Camilla exudes a kind of quality of um, f friendliness, of ease. I mean, she's prepared to um, she's prepared to muck in with Charles. She doesn't have tremendous airs and graces. She's coming from the same place as he's coming from, and he feels very comfortable with her. Through the National Osteoporosis Society, Camilla has found a suitable cause to launch her charitable work. It's um, apparent that Camilla, in her own walk of life, is tremendously popular. She does a lot of fundraising, the people, the charities she works with. Um, she's very outgoing and people adore her, so she's very fitted to the role. She could easily carry off an ambassadoress type role equally as well as Diana. Not everyone would agree. Diana's ability to empathize with suffering wherever she found it was unique and cannot and should not be imitated. Strangely, Diana seemed to have some sympathy for Camilla once her marriage was over and she was a free woman. I had lunch with Diana, just the two of us, about nine months before she died, when she was in more mellow mood about the whole issue of Charles and Camilla. She'd relaxed since the divorce settlement. She wasn't quite as spiky in what she said about Charles. And she wasn't quite as spiky as what she said about Camilla, the famous third person in their marriage. And she said to me, look, why don't they get married? I'm, I'm past caring, was how she put it. She, quite, she wished Charles reasonably well. Why, why shouldn't he marry Camilla? If These enduring memories of Diana's last campaign against landmines in Sarajevo, just days before her death, have elevated the late princess to a near religious status. But how has her death affected Charles? A great deal of trouble has been removed from his life, and that's clear. A great deal of trouble, and it was only going to get worse. They were battling over the children, 
uh, battling for their affections. I mean, Diana was, you know, she was weak in many ways. She was a deeply flawed person. She knew that, and we knew that. And uh, it's quite ridiculous to make her out to be a saint. She was human, if nothing else. For several months after Diana's death, Camilla stayed hidden away. Comparisons between the princess and the woman who destroyed her marriage were frequent. In the winter, she and Charles hunted. They were careful not to be photographed together. Aware of public sentiment after Diana's death, Charles and Camilla put on hold their plans to appear in public together. Instead, they weekended at secret locations, such as Clanover in Wales, where they stayed at the secluded leafy estate of Robert Herbert and his wife, Philippa. There has been that element of thrill and secrecy, which is undeniable. I mean, no one who's ever had an affair, a love affair, would deny that there is a thrill in using code names and secret trysts, and it adds to, the, you know, the frisson is, uh, you know, we can meet on Saturday night and nobody knows but us, and, and then, you know, someone will set apart a magnificent bedroom suite and give them their privacy and tiptoe around them, and. There must be a huge element of being terribly special for all these years. Charles says Camilla is the non-negotiable part of his life. His staff now have to include her when planning his private diary. There's no doubt at all that he set up this network and uh, he has plenty of people working for him. He doesn't have to actually make the phone calls himself to say, um, I'll be down at half past two and uh, perhaps you'd like to invite so-and-so to dinner. He's got a whole army of people only too happy to do that for him. And of course, they have grudgingly come to accept Camilla too. At Bowood House, she is welcomed by Earl and Countess Shelburne, but some aristocrats put loyalty to the Queen first and avoid Camilla. Camilla isn't really necessarily the top layer of aristocracy, so it's probably quite tough for her trying to fit in here. I mean, you'll have Prince Charles, who is, of course, the most VIP of them all, then you'll have this whole layer of squirearchy, which is what he's enjoying their hospitality when he's down here. Where does Camilla fit into that? She's neither one nor the other. Um, she's great on horseback, but around the dinner table, don't know, she hasn't got quite the same breeding. Since his arm injury, Charles plays less polo, but when he does, everything has to be right for him in recognition of his special status as the Prince of Wales. Everything has to bend for Charles, and that includes Camilla's wishes and Camilla's life. And there's no doubt that she, this isn't speculation, I know this, she defers to him. If he's in the room, she will address him as sir, the same as everyone else. And um, I mean, I don't know about what they get up to in private, although we've had a glimpse of that through the Camilla Gate tape. But I mean, it's clear that he is, he is the Lord and Master, he is the ultimate chauvinist and she allows him to be that. Charles knows that the key to the public approval of Camilla as his partner is the acceptance of her by William and Harry. But he is cautious. Charles kept his sons away from Camilla while Diana was alive for fairly obvious reasons. I think the late princess would have taken a very dim view of the, her boys cozying up to the woman she regarded as the woman who'd broken up her marriage. It's very difficult, I think, from their point of view. They want their father to be happy, and clearly this is the woman who makes their father happy. At the same time, they must be aware this is also the woman that ruined their mother's life, in her view, and that's going to be very difficult for them to forget. When Camilla held a party for Charles at Highgrove, William was invited, and so was Harry. But I think of the two boys, it's probably Harry who feels um, most unable to meet this woman who he felt made his mother terribly, terribly unhappy. I think William, even though William would appear to be a chip off the old block in the sense of his mother, they had very, very similar characteristics. I think he's of an age where he feels that um, life changes, life must go on, and that tolerance and acceptance are part of that. I mean, I think he has a more mature attitude. One of Charles' best-loved sanctuaries is the Glanusk estate in Wales, home of Sian Legberg, lady-in-waiting to Princess Anne. He often visits with William and Harry, but Camilla is currently not accepted at Glanusk and stays nearby with the Herberts at Clanover. 
This has always been his safest haven of all. He loves Charles Burke and uh, her husband William, and they love having him around. And it's comfortable, it's farmy, uh, it's all the things he loves. There's a river running through it, um, there's horses, there's shooting, there's everything that he and Harry and, and little William love. The Leg Burke's daughter, Tiggy, is a valued companion to William and Harry. Diana, however, was very jealous of their obvious attachment to her. Here is this uh, immensely warm and fun-loving and sporty and wonderful girl, um, effectively taking over Diana's children, the human beings she valued most, um, the only human beings to ever give her unconditional love. But Diana's sons have suffered the irreparable loss of their devoted mother before they were grown up. On a visit to Bhutan in 1998, Charles continues his work and to find time for himself and for his hobbies. He hopes that one day the public will accept Camilla as his partner. She is very, very important in Charles's life. She is the sustaining factor, helping him to deal with his grief over Diana, to help the boys. She is the one strong, stable, emotional factor in his life. And that over a period of time, by a sort of quietness, by a kind of being there, instead of having her thrust in front of everybody's noses, she will gain the respect. Time is a great healer. Time is enormously important than this. There's no need to rush it. In the eyes of the church, Camilla is still married. Remarriage to Prince Charles would raise religious and constitutional issues. Could she ever become queen? I think it's interesting that when people say Charles should have married Camilla in the first place 30 years ago when he dithered and didn't marry her and she married Andrew Parker Bowles, we've got to remember that probably she was unsuitable then. She was not really a candidate for bride. Uh, a, she had a bit of a past. B, she wasn't really blue-blooded enough. Uh, so he could never really have married Camilla in the first place. Now he could. There's no need. He's got his heirs, which was, would have been the problem then. Uh, it doesn't have to marry a blue-blooded divorcee. Uh, for 30 years, she's shown that she is the main woman in his life. He's called her non-negotiable part of his life on whatever basis, married or not. So uh, I, think, uh, we, I think we'll see them moving towards marriage. While the press produce fantasy photos of King Charles and Queen Camilla, the couple takes advice from government ministers about their future. Charles is reluctant to push the situation, fearing a crisis. But I think that he's wrong, myself, to think that public opinion will continue as Diana's death recedes into the background to tolerate a future king really living in sin with somebody else's ex-wife, uh, which is the situation at the moment. I think he wants to continue that way. I think she would want to get married more than him. Um, but I don't think he can maintain that status quo. Camilla, I think, is now permanently the mistress. She is now permanently behind the scenes. She will never become queen. She will never have a coronation. There, there will be always a ghost Queen Diana. By a deep paradox, Diana's death put her back into the royal family. And in a funny kind of way, she's queen from beyond the grave. Some suspect that Camilla asked her friend Lucia Santa Cruz to help her have her marriage to a Roman Catholic annulled so that she would no longer have the stigma of divorce over her head. But even then, would Charles marry her? I think it's because she's been so uncomplaining over the years that she's still there, she's still trucking on, you know. that's People think, oh, this is the most enduring love affair. And, I mean, it's, it's availability, isn't it? I mean, sadly. She's there, it's all on a plate for him. Of course, he, she amuses him and entertains him and they share great, great loves like horse riding and hunting and gardens and so on. But, but essentially, she's there. <laughs> Being accepted as the royal mistress in Charles's life may be as much as she can realistically hope for. Just as Diana's death was the ultimate tragedy, becoming Queen Camilla may be the ultimate fantasy. Crowds flock to the palace on the Queen's official birthday in June to see the royal family celebrate with a balcony appearance.
Now she faces a dilemma, whether to invite Charles's new wife Camilla with all the connotations of her past role as his mistress. Nobody really wants to poke into the murky past and history of Charles and Camilla's relationship. The word adultery seems to have been uh, tipexed out. But the truth of the matter is that they did have an adulterous relationship and that in 1975 the Queen, uh, who didn't want to blame her son for being in an adulterous relationship, said that she would never have Camilla Parker Bowles in the same room as her ever again. The Queen is aware that adultery has occurred, she knows what the consequences have been, she won't forget it, and you won't be seeing Camilla on the balcony at Buckingham Palace when the Queen is there. 1990 marked the 50th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. As the royal family watched the fly past, they didn't know that scandal would soon engulf them and threaten the monarchy itself. Their troubles really began in 1960 when Princess Margaret, the Queen's sister, married Lord Snowden. She would be the first senior royal to divorce in modern times. In 1973, the Queen's only daughter, Princess Anne, married Mark Phillips, another union doomed to unravel. Anne would later remarry in a low-key ceremony. The spectacular wedding of Charles and Diana was meant to secure the future of the Windsor dynasty. The fabulous ceremony, one sunny July day in 1981, was the royal family's own fairy tale. The dark secret of Camilla, a guest at that wedding, was concealed. Later, Diana said, there were three of us in this marriage. Sarah Ferguson, Fergie, married Prince Andrew in 1986. Their marriage, said the Archbishop, was a precious gift to the nation. Their bridal path, too, would be strewn with broken promises and shattered hopes. Divorce and scandal would tear apart the Queen's family. In the last 20 years, the British royal family has survived some pretty catastrophic events. And they have all, in different ways, uh, put that future under threat. I think by marrying Camilla, Charles hopes that he is going to secure the future of the royal family. I'm afraid I can't agree with him. I think that by marrying Camilla, Charles is taking the royal family into dangerous new territory. Camilla is going to become the most senior woman in the country after the Queen. That's a heck of a jump for a mistress, for somebody who only uh, within, within very recent memory was an extremely unpopular figure given her role, her central role in breaking up Charles and Diana's marriage, which was, after all, the cornerstone of the Windsor's future. Summer 2004, Balmoral Castle in Scotland. The Queen reluctantly began the process of change. After a series of joint appearances by Charles and Camilla, the Queen became convinced that the issue needed resolution in her own lifetime. There were meetings at Balmoral, I think they started on June the 4th, where the, the Queen was up there for a few days, staying in a, a lodge um, away from the main house, um, and a series of advisers came up from London and they started talking about the constitutional implications of the marriage. But at Christmas time, Charles decided we really do want to get married and talked with the Queen about it when, while, while she was at Sandringham. And that set things in motion for an announcement in February. I definitely feel the Queen's hand was forced. I think we can see over the period of the last three or four years that she's been snookered more than once. Uh, she has been pushed by Prince Charles and his uh, courtiers into doing things that she would prefer not to do. She was forced to meet Camilla Parker Bowles at a party at Highgrove, which Charles gave. She didn't want to do it, but uh, Prince Charles said, you don't do that and I don't come to the Queen Mother's 100th birthday. The Queen does not accept Camilla Parker Bowles, and that is a problem for the future. Ludlow, 2003. For many years now, Ludlow Racecourse has needed a new stand in the Tattersall enclosure. An enormous trouble has been taken to try and build a stand. This was a nostalgic visit for Charles. 
In opening the new Jubilee stand, Charles recalled an earlier day when he had raced at Ludlow as an amateur jockey. He stayed to see the Prince of Wales Challenge Trophy race, named after his earlier chase in October 1980, when Lady Diana Spencer, his teenage girlfriend, watched with Camilla Parker Bowles. They saw him race into second place on his horse, Alibar. Diana didn't know then that Camilla was really his mistress. Charles admitted his long liaison with Camilla in a television interview in 1994. Their affair mirrored an historic romance. Charles's great-great-grandfather, Edward VII, and Alice Keppel, Camilla's great-grandmother, were lovers. Alice was beautiful, elegant and discreet. The more adventurous Camilla emulated her role model but came out of the shadows with minor charity roles. However, it seemed that she too was content to remain a mistress. I think Camilla can never have imagined ever that she would become uh, a duchess, a princess, maybe even a queen in time. She had a teenage ambition uh, to emulate her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, uh, who had an affair with uh, King Edward VII. She thought that she too could perhaps be a royal mistress, but she never thought that it would be anything more than that. Now we look at it and we see that Alice Keppel is a mere footnote in history. Camilla is going to make a whole chapter. Charles had met Camilla in 1972. They had a brief affair until he began his naval duties in early 1973. He was away until September. In July, Camilla married his friend, handsome guards officer Andrew Parker Bowles, a favourite at the royal court. Camilla was six years into a seven-year campaign uh, to marry Andrew Parker Bowles. She knew that she was disqualified from becoming Princess of Wales on three counts. One, that her looks weren't up to it. Secondly, that her aristocratic lineage wasn't up to it. And thirdly, she was no virgin. And so there was never a chance that she was ever going to be Princess of Wales, and she knew it. She has been in the background for the better part of his life uh, as a constant uh, supporter and, and, and uh, uh, friend in good times and bad. The, the, the promotion from mistress to wife is notoriously tricky in royal history. Um, uh, there is a, a convention that uh, a mistress may not look beyond her post. Well, it looks as if this one is looking beyond her current position. If she came into this room now, we would be required, expected, to stand up and bow to her. Protocol prevented Camilla from joining Charles at many family or official events. If the Queen was present, Camilla was segregated. Charles was faced with a choice, leave the situation as it was, or try to resolve it by marriage. He was damned if he did, and he, he was damned if he didn't, really. Um, he, he's had a lot of embarrassment to put up with because Camilla has been prevented from going to spend Christmas with the royal family, Easter with the royal family. And then in November last year, Charles and Camilla were, were due to go to a wedding at Chester Cathedral. The prince's godson was getting married and Camilla was told that she wouldn't be able to sit with him because of royal protocol. She was going to have to sit behind him or possibly on the other side of the church from him. And it was just an, an embarrassment too far, a humiliation too far. The thing about all of this, we talk about royal protocol as if it's set in stone, but really royal protocol is what the monarch of the day decides. And so essentially that's just the Queen showing her distrust and disapproval of the relationship. Queen Rania of Jordan's backing gave the couple the encouragement they needed for their first public kiss. Charles has tried for a long time to persuade the public, the church and his own parents that he should make Camilla his wife. I don't think that Charles is impelled by a sense of duty to marry Camilla. I think this is something that he has devoutly wished for many, many years. It's he alone, and against a great deal of opposition from courtiers, from the Queen, from Prince Philip, who's been steamrolling through uh, this idea that he could actually marry Camilla and get away with it. Now, 
we still have to see whether this gamble is going to come off because a great proportion of the British public are really undecided as to whether this is going to be a good move or not. Just a year after Diana's tragic death, Charles claimed he has been tortured over Camilla. I thought the British people were compassionate, but I don't see much of it, he complained to an author. I think this is where, where Prince Charles often goes wrong when he complains about the people not showing him compassion. He often comes over as being a bit too sorry for himself, a bit unsure of himself, somebody who flounders, um, somebody who can't make a decision. He just seems to feel that it's his destiny to be the king, it's his destiny to do what he wants in his private life and nobody has a right to criticise him. And I think this is where he's gone wrong in many ways. Charles and Camilla often hold lavish functions to attract wealthy patrons to his charities. On such occasions, Camilla is dressed in expensive couture gowns and wears heirloom jewels. Like Alice Keppel, Camilla has become a woman of considerable substance. King Edward VII left his mistress, Alice Keppel, Camilla's great-grandmother, vastly wealthy when he died. He made sure that she had enough money in her coffers, not only for her own lifetime, but for the lifetime of her children and great-grandchildren. And it is true that Camilla has lived off some of the money which uh, her great-grandmother left and passed down. I think that Prince Charles, almost certainly looking to history, will have made exactly the same provisions and Camilla will be very rich when he dies. Camilla will still have to endure comparisons with Diana. As Charles' fiancée, the teenage Diana was already an attractive girl with an eye-catching figure. Highly photogenic, she soon outshone Charles, who grew jealous of his glamorous young wife. To others, her visual appeal, together with her sparkling personality, proved an irresistible combination. She became a national asset, a roving ambassador for her country. Diana could flirt for Britain, and it's, it is uh, an underused diplomatic weapon. I mean, innocent flirting, which is what it was, uh, can have a very disarming effect on the most unlikely people. And it was one of Diana's great talents, I think, that while she was very, very conscious of the need to, to carry out this sort of high-level diplomatic activity to the letter, and she was, she was extremely conscientious about it. Nevertheless, she could add her own bit of sparkle, and she did over and over again. I mean, the President of Egypt, the President of the United States, the President of France, um, the President of Zimbabwe. He said, she makes you feel good. And nobody thought that, that he meant that she made him feel virtuous. She gave him a good feeling. That was one of her jobs, as she saw it, to go around the world giving people good feelings, and that included presidents just as much as it included orphans and, and the victims of disease. I'm only trying to highlight a problem that's going on all around the world. She got out of her palace most days, and she got in her car and she went off and she did her job. And it was a very unusual job, and it was a very stressful one, but it could also be very rewarding. And the most rewarding part of it was usually the people that she met. And whether it was the East End of London or the East End of Lahore, if she met people with whom she could communicate, who needed her, uh, who uh, lightened her day, because the rest of her life was pretty gloomy, then that was a successful day. And she responded to that. That's what made her such a good princess. She was great at her job because she committed herself to it emotionally and mentally. Camilla Parker Bell is in a very different situation. Uh, I think probably she must aim to attract acceptance and maybe in the far distant future uh, affection too. But right now, even attracting acceptance is going to be a tough call. It's going to require a lot of things to go right and it's going to require her to come across to the British people and to the wider world as a, a worthy successor to Diana. Camilla is a woman known for hunting rather than caring. Charles has presented her through a choreographed public relations campaign with little thought about her image. In my view, this is putting the cart before the horse. I think that what should have happened is 
that Camilla should have been introduced to the British nation. We know nothing about her. She's an enigma. She's hidden behind palace walls for longer than I care to remember. And uh, she has never been out, pressed the flesh, talked to the British public, uh, and allowed herself to be measured by their standards. The whole thing about having a royal family is that they pay their dues, they work for their living, they earn their living by doing good deeds, by helping charitable organisations. And Camilla does virtually nothing like that. She does a little bit of help for the Osteoporosis Society, but she's not seen to be helping anybody except herself. The British public, the world, has known of Camilla as a mistress. Now they're going to have to start thinking of Camilla as a queen. First, they're going to have to start thinking of her as a princess of Wales, which is what, in effect, she will be. And then they're going to have to think of her as a queen. And even if she isn't going to be queen in the foreseeable future, uh, that is how people are going to have to picture her. That is the, the image she's going to have to live up to. And I think it's most unlikely uh, that she is going to sell herself to the British public, to the, to the, to the world at large, as uh, uh, anything like a suitably regal figure commanding the sort of near universal respect that a head of state needs to have. Approaching 80, the Queen is admired throughout the world for her lifelong dedication to duty. However, there is one area where she might have done things differently. We now know through videotapes made in Diana's lifetime that she went to the Queen to seek help over Charles and Camilla, but the Queen refused to interfere. Diana decided to betray Charles and expose his affair. It's a real pity that so many chances to produce a happier outcome went begging. I was aware that, that there were opportunities for other members of the royal family to help Charles and Diana through the crisis that they faced, and in particular, help Diana. She was not a natural rebel. In fact, more often, she yearned for reassurance and encouragement and guidance. Whether the words couldn't be found or whether Diana didn't hear them, uh, she uh, felt herself excluded from the royal organization. Uh, and uh, while she wasn't a rebel, she wasn't a wimp either. And when, as she saw it, she felt um, outnumbered and conspired against, she was defiant. The Queen did not condone Camilla's conduct. The couple adopted a strategy of appearing together at events for his own charities, such as the Prince's Trust, but the Queen refused to allow Camilla to join Charles on official royal duties. The Queen was worried about upsetting more traditional uh, supporters of the monarchy. She didn't want Camilla to be seen to be part of the family. But of course, the, the wedding announcement has, has just exacerbated the problems, really, and it's, it's, it's proved very, very divisive. Camilla retained a group of female friends who were almost ladies-in-waiting. Some, like Emily van Kutzum, joined her on exotic holidays. Emily has now fallen out of favour after a feud with Camilla. At the new royal court of Charles and Camilla, friends from skiing, hunting and polo want to hold sway. Among them is Charles's skiing friend and Camilla's staunchest supporter, Patty Palmer Tomkinson. She reunited them four years after Charles's marriage. She might be considered a queen maker. Patty and her husband Charlie's daughters, Santa, a romantic novelist, and Tara, a dedicated partygoer and reformed drug addict, are among the prince's social set. The queen chooses less exuberant friends. For Charles, such public frivolity will have to end when he eventually succeeds his mother. For Camilla, adulation from her supporters needs to be tempered with constraint. It's said that Camilla is from good, middle-of-the-road English county stock. And it may well be that that transforms very happily into good royal stock as well. A lot depends on how she perceives herself, how she uh, uses her new position. It's an enormously influential one. Uh, it rather depends, to be brief, on whether she takes herself rather grandly or whether she keeps a sense of proportion. 
Camilla will not use the title Princess of Wales. She will be Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall. As Duke of Cornwall, Charles benefits from the vast revenues of the duchy. He has an income of around £12 million a year on which he pays only voluntary tax. Recently, a parliamentary committee started investigating his finances. One of the most embarrassing moments in uh, Charles's recent past is the investigation by the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee uh, where they showed that uh, he was getting away with blue murder. This is a man, Prince Charles, who has about a hundred personal staff to look after just him. I mean, the Queen doesn't get close to having that many. At the Queen's discretion, Camilla will now be able to use the helicopter and two aircraft of the Royal Air Squadron for engagements. The Royal Train will now be officially available. A fleet of eight chauffeur-driven, gleaming limousines, two Bentleys, three Rolls and three Daimlers will be at Camilla's disposal with the Queen's permission. Carriages with footmen in livery may drive the new Duchess of Cornwall. Camilla has already entertained guests at Buckingham Palace with Charles on behalf of his charities. As his wife, she will have more frequent use of those miles of red carpet and the impressive state rooms that tourists admire each summer when the palace is open to the public. She might discover that the palace has many secrets. Some staff have run a brisk trade in unwanted gifts passed on by their royal bosses. The royals themselves have been satirised by the British press with comparisons to comic television characters. Then, an undercover reporter gained a footman's post. His detailed account of life behind palace walls contained pictures of the Queen's breakfast table, complete with Tupperware boxes. The public had only seen the state apartments. Now they found out how the Queen lived. Clearly there was a degree of intrusion by a, a reporter impersonating a member of the Queen's household. Nevertheless, uh, the revelations that he produced, such as the fact that the Queen liked her breakfast cereals served out of Tupperware boxes, was endearing and, and, and kind of warm. And I think the public were astonished by it, and I think they, they felt that much more about the Queen. It made her look much more like one of them, one of us. The Queen and her family are extremely middle class, and a lot of European aristocrats look down their noses at the Windsors because their, you know, their favourite preoccupations are gin and GGs and you know horse racing and they're not elegant they don't dress well they're dumpy frumpy uh, sorts of people and they they seem to think that Tupperware boxes on the breakfast table well that would be the sort of thing you'd expect from middle-class people like the Windsors. As heir to the throne Charles is used to deference when he meets the public. Camilla will expect curtsies as Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall there was no protocol when she visited Chile alone to visit Lucia Santa Cruz, an old friend who introduced her to Charles in 1972. Camilla was besieged by paparazzi and chased by interviewers. From now on, the royal machinery will protect her from nuisance as well as danger. She will have bodyguards for private holidays. The Duchess of Cornwall will enjoy official tours courtesy of the British taxpayer. She will effectively be on the public payroll. Reconnaissance visits by Charles's staff will ensure that every aspect of foreign tours run smoothly. A protective cordon will screen her from intrusive questioners. Staff will make sure that she is never put in this position again. Her cars will be checked and kept under surveillance for potential kidnap or assassination attempts. Paparazzi will be kept at a distance and backup vehicles will prevent them from following too closely. On this visit to Chile, there was an eerie reminder of Diana's fatal crash in Paris. Camilla too was chased into a tunnel by paparazzi. Diana gave up her bodyguard in 1993 after her separation from Charles. She had to face rough treatment when she holidayed with just friends. Her former bodyguard believes that dispensing with her police protection led directly to her death in Paris after a car crash. It's my view that had Scotland Yard been in charge of that security that night,
irrespective of any conspiracy theories or any plans to attack her or take her life that night, had the security been there, provided by Scotland Yard, you and I would not be having this conversation. I don't think she understood the degree to which her Scotland Yard protection officers made her life bearable. And I think her decision to dispense with them was rather petulant and was intended to prompt sympathy from people who pretty soon were able to see the consequences of her being unguarded. Ken Wharf was Diana's eyes and ears. He protected her at home and abroad from attacks by assassins and stalkers. A trained marksman, his casual air belied his own role as a potential bullet catcher. Whatever the occasion, no one escaped his scrutiny. If Camilla is to follow in Diana's footsteps, she will need another Ken to shadow her and keep the press at bay. Here in Egypt, Ken showed he was good at dealing with the press, allowing Diana the chance to pose for photographers before continuing her tour. On this trip, while she stayed at the ambassador's residence in Cairo, Ken kept guard while she took a dip in the pool. Diana was pretty streetwise, and, and, and she had, you know, very, very good peripheral vision. And I think it was her, actually, uh, at the same time as, uh, as myself, spotted some people on a roof on a, on a high-rise building nearby. I was almost certain that, that, that it was the media that were taking pictures of Diana in the pool. All I did to help that was to try and obscure the, the shots that were being taken. Well, you know, it, it didn't always work, um, and that wasn't necessarily my role. But in, in fact, if you look at it from a security standpoint, it was actually not a bad thing to do. But of course, Diana was discussing it then and saying, look, you know, what, am I, what do I do here? Do I have to get out? I said, well, no, stay there, do what you want. She said, well, I never get any peace here, do I? I said, well, no, but that's part and parcel of being the Princess of Wales. There's not much I can do about it. Ken was a reliable companion too, especially every August when the royal family returned to their highland retreat, Balmoral. There were aspects of, of Balmoral life she didn't like, but, but very often she would ring me up and say, look, I need to go for a walk. And I would go and we'd walk for miles along the River Dee, and, um, and that was her freedom. But I think there were many aspects of Balmoral that she actually rather enjoyed. Towards the end, of course, the relationship, it was just too close for home. You, you, you've got the mother-in-law and your father-in-law, and you're a bit on a limb there. And so she's rather dependent um, uh, on, on speaking to members of her staff. Staff saw Charles and Diana in less formal surroundings of Highgrove, the couple's country home in Gloucestershire. This was their weekend retreat. Charles and his sons kept their pets there. Charles's dog, Tigger, was unpopular with some of the staff. Tigger and Mervyn, the chef, didn't have a very good relationship because Mervyn didn't want uh, dogs in the kitchen. But one morning, uh, Tigger made a run for, uh, for something that fell out of the pan, at which point Mervyn grabbed the dog by the back of the neck and then opened up the heater tray of the oven and put the dog in the, in the heater tray. And of course, who should come in, literally almost immediately, was the Prince of Wales who said, has anybody seen Tigger? Well, I couldn't actually turn around and say, sorry, sir, the dog's in the oven. But he did go outside and come again. I said, Mervyn, get the dog out. Because the dog now was, was, was instead of being a sort of semi-rough-haired uh, skin, uh, Jack Russell was now a smooth-skinned Russell with a sort of fairly high temperature. So we got it moving through it in the hallway. And the Prince came through the door and said, ah, oh, Tigger, there you are. He said, you look amazingly hot. Camilla is learning that the staff play a crucial role in any palace. They're also aware of any tensions in the relationships of their bosses. You know, palace is a pretty lonely place, and, you know, members of the royal family rely uh, upon members of staff, you know, your valets, your butler, your maid, or whatever you want to call it. In the Prince and Princess of Wales, of case, you know, it was pretty obvious that, that, that the marriage w was going through uh, a, a difficult period. But it was kept very much under wraps. You know, everybody knew in the circle the, the, of her friends, everybody knew that worked within the palace that, that there were problems with their marriage. And it wasn't too difficult to see that. I think it's a credit here to, to, to her staff that, that very little was said. Working in royal residences means poor pay and long hours. Some staff have found other ways of increasing their income such as selling information and trinkets passed on to them by their bosses. 
Recent events have made their livelihood and security uncertain. You're always prey to the royal order of the boot. You know, you can be in one day and out the next. And it's very much been tightened up because of all the leaks and because, you know, a Daily Mirror reporter got a job there and then revealed far too much for the Queen's liking. So you're hampered, you've got to sign all these secrecy acts, confidentiality agreements, and, and, and the pay is a pittance. That's why so many of them were selling off these gifts. They pick up these trinkets and things, or letters or whatever, and they sell them on eBay, or they sell them through people in America who adore the royal family, and to supplement their appalling pay. Paul Burrell, Diana's butler, worked for the Diana Memorial Fund after her death. With her secretary, Jacqueline Allen, they were honored guests at an American fundraising event. This gift to borrow from Diana and other items was sold to raise money for good causes. A replica of the blue diamond necklace worn by Kate Winslet in the film Titanic raised over a million pounds. Then it emerged that Burrell had stashed hundreds of the princess's belongings in his home. Charged with theft, he was tried at the Old Bailey. His court case was a fiasco. He was cleared when the Queen recalled a conversation in which he told her he was safeguarding some of the princess's papers. Later, he revealed details of his private talk with the Queen. The Burrell trial collapsed because it should never have gone ahead in the first place. I mean, they made a fundamental mistake. They were misled at the royals by um, what uh, was presented to them by the police. Um, had uh, the Prince of Wales taken the advice that was proffered to him by a number of senior figures on his staff, uh, to have met with Burrell, to hear with Burrell before the case began, he could have resolved it. And um, Burrell was, not, was no threat to them. And um, all the material uh, that Burrell had was buried in his attic. It wasn't going to be sold. It wasn't going to go anywhere. But it went ahead. He was prosecuted. And the trial collapsed like many of us knew it would do because he had done fundamentally nothing wrong. Burrell then betrayed secrets about Diana, Charles and Camilla in a book. It was serialized with explosive headlines in a tabloid paper. He betrayed Diana, there's no two ways about it. The man who said for years he would never, never leak anything did it to just to make money because he was so upset when he lost his job and his home when Diana died and he couldn't forgive the royal family. He went to see the Queen, begged her to let him stay on in Kensington Palace and she said no. After Diana's death, her royal jewelry was returned to the palace. The princess had many heritage items, some, like this necklace, dating to the Queen's grandmother. The boys inherited most of Diana's jewellery that wasn't part of the royal collection, and they went and chose certain pieces that they wanted. I believe that uh, Harry took her Cartier watch and William took her engagement ring. But obviously, her personal jewellery is being kept for them and their future wives. The tiaras that belonged to the Queen that she'd borrowed, which get handed down from generation to generation, would have gone back into the, into the royal jewellery pool. The Duchess of Cornwall might well be seen wearing some of the royal gems, even some of the Queen's personal collection. Perhaps not the state diadem, a crown jewel, but there are seven other sumptuous tiaras, including the Queen's favourite the pearl and diamond tiara, and the Russian fringe tiara. There are 15 important necklaces, scores of earrings, bracelets and rings in the collection, plus many other pieces from earlier queens. On their engagement, Charles gave Camilla a diamond ring which belonged to the late Queen Mother. It's worth half a million pounds. In 1901, after the death of Queen Victoria, Edward VII, Alice Keppel's lover, and his queen, Alexandra, were crowned. Alexandra wore a crown containing the fabulous Koh-i-Noor diamond, said to bring bad luck to a male owner. The Queen Mother wore it in her own consort's crown on her coronation day in 1937. It was placed on her coffin at her funeral in 2002. Now in the Tower of London with the crown jewels, could it be worn next by Camilla at Charles's coronation? 
Alice Keppel knew that her part in Edward VII's life was strictly private. A softening up the public campaign, waged for several years, has driven the course of events leading to Charles's second marriage. Although divorced in 1996, in the eyes of some people, Diana's death made him a widower. Camilla had divorced in 1995. She was a guest at Charles's first wedding, press began to speculate on her possible marriage to Charles. First, there were religious and constitutional obstacles to be overcome. Similar difficulties faced Edward VIII in 1936. His prime minister, Stanley Baldwin, forced him to choose between the throne and divorcee Wallace Simpson. For her, he abdicated. They married in France and lived in exile. Their memory still haunts the royal family. Princess Margaret also faced a stark choice between keeping her royal position and marrying Group Captain Peter Townsend, a divorced man. Margaret owed her loyalty to her sister, the newly crowned Queen, and had to abide by the prevailing standards of the 1950s. Princess Margaret didn't get married in 1953 because the government of the day advised the Queen that it would not be acceptable to the British public, uh, largely because of uh, the Church of England's reservations. In 1992, the divorced Princess Anne sidestepped the Church of England. She married Tim Lawrence at Balmoral's Crathy Church under the easier rules of the Church of Scotland. George Carey, then the Archbishop of Canterbury, explored ways to allow Charles and Camilla to marry. The compromise of a civil wedding and a church blessing was made by his successor, Rowan Williams. The church has had a very significant role in forcing Charles's hand in marriage. Uh, they have been very uncomfortable for a long time to see Charles and Camilla uh, living as they see it in sin. They seem to be divided about it. Uh, there's one section of the church that believes that that people should be allowed a second chance of happiness. And then there's another group who believe that marriage is sacred and that the guilty parties in a divorce especially should not be allowed to remarry. So I can see that the sort of old guard in the Church of England would say, no, 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 can't possibly marry them. Charles's civil wedding problems go back to 1836 when Queen Victoria was still heir to the throne. In 1840, the young queen married her German cousin, Prince Albert, in a religious service at the Chapel Royal at St. James's Palace. Group Captain Peter Townsend and Princess Margaret were prevented from marrying in a civil ceremony by the 1836 Act and by a later one. There are various laws governing marriages of the royal family. Um, we go back to the 1836 Marriage Act, the, the 1949 Marriage Act, which both appear very, very clearly to prevent members of the royal family from marrying in civil ceremonies. There's a danger that, that if this law isn't tested now in court, then future members of the royal family run the risk of getting married illegally and their spouses losing rights of inheritance. Unless the government changes the law now, somebody is going to prove that that marriage is illegal. It is legally contentious, and I'm afraid that's going to go into the history books. And for better or worse, and I fear it may be for worse, when people look back uh, on, this, on this whole episode, the fact that it was legally dubious is going to be one of the things that they notice and, and uh, don't like. Charles took advice from Britain's Lord Chancellor over the legality of a civil wedding. He was told that human rights legislation overturned previous laws banning the royal family from having civil weddings. The great thing about the royal family is they make it up as they go along. They can do anything they want. What they like to do is they like to cite precedent. And uh, if they want to do something and it hasn't been done recently, they can say, oh, it was done in Henry VIII's time, it's done in Queen Victoria's time. If they haven't uh, got a precedent, then they just make it up and say, oh, well, that's how it should be anyway. Uh, and the great thing is really that they get away with murder simply because uh, they want to. And uh, it's very interesting to see how inventive they can be with their own rules. Perhaps Camilla's biographer is right to be cynical. It was also claimed that members of the royal family did not have to post their bans of marriage 
but Charles was quick to do so in Sirencester, a town near his country home. Charles's title makes it an unusual addition to the local list. By attending Sunday service at a parish close to Highgrove, he is trying to avoid a rift with the wider church over his civil wedding. Settling for a church blessing will not satisfy everyone, and some might not regard his marriage as valid. Soon after his engagement, Charles made an official visit to Australia without Camilla. He faced an unenthusiastic reception. His visit coincided with two new royal stars. Stealing the show were Crown Prince Frederick of Denmark and his Tasmanian-born wife, Princess Mary, a former Sydney estate agent. Her presence recalled an earlier visit in 1983 when the young Princess Diana made her first official tour of Australia. Diana and Charles received a rapturous reception. These were the glory days of the British royal family. Surely Camilla cannot hope for such popularity. I imagine that, that reaction to Camilla in Australia will be comparable to reaction to Camilla here, in that some people uh, will think she's a good thing, not many, I suspect. Uh, more people will think that she's no substitute for Diana and that, in fact, by taking Diana's place, uh, Charles is showing a lack of respect for Diana. Uh, but the great majority will be more or less indifferent. Opinion polls uh, that seem to show that support for a republic is growing again in Australia and when Australians are faced with the prospect of Charles becoming their next king with Camilla as his wife, support for a republic has grown even more in the opinion polls. Charles should also consider the reactions of all the 15 nations of the Commonwealth where the Queen is head of state. I think the Commonwealth has been sadly neglected, not so much by the Queen who takes her duty to the the Commonwealth as head of the Commonwealth very seriously. Uh, but I know that Prince Charles uh, is not as enthusiastic about his Commonwealth duties as his mother is. And I think it's a matter of great regret that uh, the, the future of the British monarchy seems to be turning its, its attention rather more towards Europe than towards the, uh, the remaining bits of the, of the world which look to Buckingham Palace uh, for, uh, for a lead, for a symbolic head. Windsor Castle was announced as the venue of the wedding. Many royal marriages and christenings have taken place within its ancient stone walls. St George's Chapel was used in 1992 for a wedding attended by all the royal family. It was the marriage of Lady Helen Windsor, daughter of the Queen's cousin, the Duke of Kent. And in 1999, Prince Edward married Sophie Rees-Jones at St George's Chapel. He is the only one of the Queen's children who has not divorced. The chapel is ornate and regally splendid with the atmosphere of a cathedral. Charles' plans to marry there were dashed by a legal technicality. It emerged after they'd made the announcement, a rather hurried announcement provoked by a leak to a newspaper, that they couldn't get married in Windsor Castle without allowing the public to get married there for the following three years. The Queen was horrified at the thought of her weekends being interrupted by members of the public coming in to get married and all sorts of chaos would ensue. Charles's officials are starting from scratch with this one and they're trying to blend in with the Queen's household and, and what it requires. And I think that it's, it's hardly surprising uh, that here and there things have come unstuck. The couple will now make the short journey from the castle through the town of Windsor to the register office in the Guildhall. The low-key ceremony will be held in the Ascot Room. There will be no television cameras and only Camilla's family and Charles's sons will attend. Notably, the Queen will be absent. It does go against the grain for the Queen not to go to the wedding. Monarchy is all about theatre, really, and I think part of the problem is the Queen was worried that this was turning into a farce and she didn't want to be associated with, with something that is making the monarchy the object of ridicule all around the world at the moment. How different it all was the last time Charles married. Around the world, 750 million watched the event. 
Many of those who believed the fairy tale are still angered by Charles's deception and the tragic loss of Diana. I think the public are very cynical about the royal family. I think the image of them has deteriorated year by year for the last 15 or 20 years. There are too many people who really don't trust Prince Charles at all and I don't think they want him as the king. People under 40 think the Queen and other members of the royal family, they're just celebrities like Michael Jackson or Robbie Williams and there's a soap opera going on and they're quite interested every now and then to see what the latest instalment of the soap opera is. For people over 40, um, they, take, they still generally take the monarchy quite seriously and it's those people in particular, I think, who've been upset by the prospect of a future king getting married to a woman whose adultery with Charles helped cause the breakdown of the marriage to Diana. February 1981, Charles and Diana faced the cameras for their engagement. Notice Diana's reply to the interviewer. And I, I, I'm amazed that she's uh, been brave enough to take me on. <laughs> and I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> February 2005, another engagement to another English blonde. Uncannily, her words echo Diana's, of course. Did he get down on one knee to propose? <laughs> Camilla is reluctant to be compared to Diana with her extraordinary appeal. So far, Camilla has adopted only a limited charity profile. She will never be someone who undertakes an awful lot of royal duties, someone who is constantly in the newspapers. She will try anyway to be somebody who is in the background just supporting her husband and getting along very quietly with being a, a member of the royal family. She clearly is somebody who is very well suited for Charles. People who meet her say that she is very good at putting them at their ease. She's a very strong, steady person. And I think Charles is somebody who needs constant reassurance. His personal life is a bit of a disaster and that's what's threatening the monarchy. Camilla will be in the Royal Carriage Parade at Ascot Races each summer. She has to be seen as part of the family so that she is accepted as princess consort when Charles is king. For the present, the Duchess of Cornwall will be the second lady in the land, princess of Wales in all but name, and she could still become queen. With Charles and Camilla, we're into new territory. The guys who are actually having organized this thing don't have any precedent to refer to. There isn't a book of rules, so they're having to make it up as they go along. Prince Charles obviously believes that he could ascend the throne with Camilla by his side. Whether she's called a princess consort or a queen is, is pretty irrelevant. I think the, uh, the rule is that the wife of the king is automatically the queen. So in his eyes, this is quite doable. We will wait and see whether the jury of public opinion will actually come out in his favour. Uh, it's a very tricky road ahead for the Prince of Wales. Uh, he's put his reputation on the line with this marriage. We're going to have to see whether he can get away with it. The same prince, another wife, a second fairy tale. Based on scandal and tragedy, this one cannot be sold as a storybook romance. The question now is can the monarchy survive a King Charles and a Queen Camilla? From soldier's wife to royal mistress to royal consort. Camilla Parker Bowles has made a unique transformation. This majestic makeover has been achieved by expensive grooming. Cosmetic dentistry, Botox injections, and even a facelift have been rumored. Dowdy country clothes have been banished and replaced by sleek new outfits. Couture houses such as Valentino and Versace now clothe the mature figure so loved by the Prince of Wales. No longer hiding in rural seclusion, Camilla enjoys the ritz and glitz of her celebrity status. Plays and premieres, grand dinners and parties, lavish holidays and suites in royal homes fill the life of the best-kept woman in Britain.
Camillo was carefully repackaged and presented to the public as a wife in waiting. She is the official uh, Mrs. Wales. She's having a wonderful time. Money is no object. Charles adores her. He showers her with jewels. She is a very rich woman now, thanks to her royal lover. A front row place beside the catwalk at fashion parades, such as Stella McCartney's Chloe show in Paris, marked Camilla as a client with international prestige. She's learned to dress the royal way, with restrained outfits, conspicuous hats and serious jewellery. Camilla gets sent to New York to have a bit of a makeover and she gets given a, a, a big clothes allowance by Charles to go and look right. The one thing where she does, of course, score wonderfully now, she is beginning to get some decent jewellery, the proper stuff from Charles. Camilla is adorned with fabulous gems at events such as her 50th birthday party held at Highgrove, Charles's country home. At his 50th party, she wore this aquamarine and diamond necklace. It belonged to her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel, mistress of King Edward VII, Charles's great-great-grandfather. Charles is fascinated by today's repetition of their great romance. He goes out of his way to find jewellery which belonged to her great-grandmother, Alice Keppel. Uh, he wants to revisit history, and what he's done is gone out of his way to try and find all the jewellery which King Edward VII gave to Alice Keppel and give it back to Camilla. Now, you can call it sentimental, or you can call it what you want. Some would call it expensive. Charles learned that a well-kept mistress can cost as much as a wife. Camilla wears clothes from Versace one of Diana's favourite fashion labels. The princess wore a Versace gown in Chicago in 1996. Tall, slim and elegant, she was an iconic style setter. Glamour gowns are less suited to the more matronly figure, as Camilla has discovered. I think she feels uncomfortable wearing these clothes, which is why she is such a figure of fun with the British press. It doesn't quite hang together right and uh, she does not like the comparisons with Princess Diana. Well, a lot of photographers came to me recently and said, my God, we took some pictures of Camilla last night and she looked transformed. She was a different woman, no lines on her around her eyes. Apart from that, I've noticed that she's trying a lot harder with her makeup and her hair. For many years, Camilla and I have been to the same hairdresser and I've seen her sitting at the next wash basin to me. But when she had her hair done, she'd insist on brushing it out herself. She wouldn't let the professionals do it. And she always had a kind of 1970s bad fire of faucet majors kind of look to her hair that was very dated, but she seemed to like it like that. That seems to have changed. It's a bit more slick, it's a bit more polished, a bit more professional nowadays. So she's certainly trying harder. And one reason for that, so I'm told, could be that she's worried about hanging on to her prince and she's trying very hard to to look the part and to keep him. Luxurious holidays, courtesy of wealthy friends with sumptuous villas and palatial yachts, have a certain appeal. A Greek island's cruise on the mega yacht Alexander cost $90,000 a day, but it's free to Charles, Camilla and their guests. There are Charles's residences to enjoy. Highgrove, with its cherished gardens and admired architecture, was chosen by Camilla. It's where she stables her horses, convenient for a woman who likes to hunt with the local gentry, a hobby which costs Charles around £45,000 a year. On the Queen's Balmoral estate in Scotland, there is Burke Hall, once the Queen Mother's home. It was the scene of many a secret rendezvous. She was quite willing to throw open her house at Burke Hall in the Highlands for Charles and Camilla. And of course, nowadays, it's Charles's home. The Queen has, has passed it on to him, and he's redecorated it, and he and Camilla spend many holidays there. Owned by a trust, the Castle of May on the northern tip of Scotland was the Queen Mother's private home. Charles adored his grandmother and feels that he and Camilla are keeping her memory alive by staying in her favorite retreat. Camilla is Chatelain of Clarence House, the Queen Mother's old London home. It's worth £150 million. 
when everybody moved into Clarence House once its refurbishment was complete, that William and Harry found themselves living for the first time with their father's mistress. Now, if that was difficult enough, it was made more difficult by the fact that Camilla also imported her father, Major Bruce Shand. And so suddenly, there are people uh, that they don't really know terribly well, and they're supposed to share a roof with them. And I think both William and Harry found that a very uncomfortable experience. Mark Bolland, who has since left the Prince's household for a media relations career, also served Camilla. Courtiers like Bolland owed allegiance to both the Prince and his mistress. I wouldn't call them sycophants, but I would say that they're all extremely loyal to Prince Charles, and therefore, when Camilla moved in, they're extremely loyal to her. If they want to keep their jobs, they have to like it or lump it. Being a royal courtier is uh, pretty much a lickspittle job, you know, you, you uh, tug your forelock to the boss and if the boss has got a new girlfriend, then you go along with whatever the girlfriend says. Whatever they feel privately, she's part of the management team now and they have to work to her as well as work to Prince Charles. It's a wonderful life for a woman who lives like a queen but has few duties, except taking over Charles's splendid homes. Camilla is now running the royal show. She's in charge of three royal residences, uh, Clarence House, the main royal residence, Burke Hall, the Scottish residence, and Highgrove, which, you must remember, is the house that she chose for Prince Charles, not Prince Charles choosing for himself. She had a very strong say in the way that the houses were refurbished. Uh, she oversaw the way that the gardens were reorganized and she really really runs the everyday business of all the royal palaces on Prince Charles's behalf. She's a very powerful figure in that way and although we don't see very much of her in public at the moment you mustn't underestimate the power which she wields bo both over the Prince of Wales and the Prince of Wales's staff and households. Camilla's own home, Raymill House, was bought after her divorce in 1995. Smaller and less imposing than Highgrove a few miles away, the house was redecorated and the gardens maintained to exacting standards, with costs met by Charles. Members of his close circle helped to buy the property. When she wanted to buy her country home in Wiltshire, a group of Prince Charles's friends raised the money for the mortgage, and so they kind of bailed her out. Apart from the upkeep of the 17-acre estate, Charles also pays for Camilla's security system. He provides her with highly trained bodyguards to protect her from harm. In 1997, Camilla had a minor accident on the winding roads leading to Highgrove. Charles pays all her motoring costs. Certainly now, her clothes, her running expenses, her car, uh, the two police, former police people who, who look after her, chauffeur her around and act as her protection officers, they're all paid for by Prince Charles. Camilla undertakes some low-key charity work. She became a patron of the Wiltshire Bobby Vans Appeal, a scheme which provides voluntary home security. In 2004, she joined Prince Charles on a public engagement for the appeal. Her sister, Annabel Elliott, came to see the couple's fundraising attempt. They were warmly received in a county which is home territory for Camilla, a shrewd way of guaranteeing public approval for their relationship. One onlooker told the press, it's nice to see them together. They've got a life to lead, haven't they? I don't see why not, we can't all live in the past. but this campaign to launch Camilla as a charity queen has had to proceed with caution. If she did take on more charity work, she might be accused of following it or trying to follow in Diana's footsteps, but the problem is she's not very good. What her biographer, Christopher Wilson, described it to me like this. He said, she's great one-to-one, -one, but she's no good with the crowd. The difficulty for Camilla is she's uneasy in the presence of the British public. Diana had a wonderful magnetic charm which made everybody feel better once they'd spoken to her or met her. And so it made her an absolute natural going out on the charity circuit, raising money and raising awareness. Camilla just doesn't have that common touch. And as a result, she has stayed away from the one vehicle which could bring her in contact with the British public and allow the British public to assess for themselves 
whether this woman who lives with the Prince of Wales is worthy of their support. In 1997, Camilla became a patron of the National Osteoporosis Society. Although she had a personal interest in the bone thinning disease, the charity was a useful launching point for a more public role. Posing with British celebrities to raise the charity's profile also served to enhance her own. She became president of the society in 2001. Her self-assurance grew quickly as she took on more engagements. In 2002, she attended the society's book launch. What's so special about this little book of calm? Well, I think anybody who's very interested in osteoporosis should read it. It's very cheap, it's very good reading, and it'll tell you all about it. Why are you particularly interested in it? Uh, my mother died. Thank you. Acting as an ambassador for the society, she attended the World Congress on Osteoporosis in Lisbon, opened by Queen Rania of Jordan. Camilla made a speech. My family knew nothing about osteoporosis. The local GP was kind and sympathetic, but he, like us, was able to do little to alleviate the terrible pain my mother suffered so stoically. We watched in horror as she quite literally shrunk in front of our eyes. Camilla took her place with confidence at this round table of international women's leaders. She had begun to perform like a royal. A walk with the prince in Green Park near Buckingham Palace was another milestone in Operation Camilla, the carefully orchestrated campaign by Charles's spin doctors to gain acceptance for the couple. Charles and Camilla met on the polo field at Smith's Lawn near Windsor in 1971. Charles began a lifetime romance with Camilla, but she was already in love with another polo player, Charles's friend, handsome guards officer Andrew Parker Bowles. He had quite a collection of female admirers. After a brief affair with Charles, Camilla married Andrew. She was not aristocratic enough to be Princess of Wales, and Charles was committed to a naval career. Her marriage did not end the royal liaison. On leave from the Navy, Charles would meet Camilla at Hall Place, the home of her grandmother. Camilla helped him choose a wife to provide heirs to the throne. Lady Diana Spencer was ideally suited. Lady Diana. There's a, we thought it was going to be announcing on his 32nd birthday, but uh, there wasn't. And he told the reporters yesterday that it may be coming soon. Have you any comment to make about that? Maybe done. Maybe done. No comment all that. Did you have a good weekend, though? It's worked now, OK? <laughs> the engagement was finally announced in February 1981, shortly before Charles left for a trip to Australia. Minutes before these pictures, Charles had taken an intimate call from Camilla. His teenage fiance knew and was left fighting back the tears. She was crying at the airport because she knew instinctively that this wasn't going well, that Charles still was obsessing about Camilla. He thought about her. We saw later, of course, in the, uh, the Royal Honeymoon that the cufflinks and the photographs of Camilla, which fell out of his uh, pocketbook, these are things that she knew instinctively already, that his mind and thoughts were with Camilla and not with her, his future wife. Charles stayed on the remote ranch in Queensland of his old polo trainer, Sinclair Hill. He didn't contact Diana, but kept in touch with Camilla. From Sinclair Hill's home, the prince's phone calls to a woman were secretly recorded, and the bugged love tapes passed to the press, who naturally assumed that the mystery female was Diana. I think it must have been a double blow for Diana, because already there had been the royal train incident when it was suggested that Diana had spent the night on the royal train with Charles, in fact, we now know it was Camilla Parker Bowles. Now, this new blow, she is just a moment away from actually getting married to Prince Charles, and she discovers that he's been making private telephone calls which have been bugged. They're supposed to be to Diana, but in fact, they're to Camilla. Now, she is within weeks of actually getting married to Prince Charles. Charles isn't calling her at home, but he's calling Camilla. Can you imagine what was going on in her mind? 
Later, Diana called her wedding day the most emotionally confusing day of my life. Camilla had been in St Paul's Cathedral as Diana and Charles exchanged their wedding vows. For several years, the palace protected the fairy tale. When the palace deceived the British public and the media about the state of the marriage of Charles and Diana and the fact that Camilla was involved, they always operate at the palace a defensive public relations system, not an offensive one. So they were trying to protect his reputation. And a lot of people were fooled for a long time, myself included. I thought that he's far too noble a person to be unfaithful to his wife and betray his marriage vows. But he said, do you expect me to be the first Prince of Wales doesn't have a mistress? Leading the guard of honour for the carriage taking the couple to their honeymoon was Camilla's husband, Andrew Parker Bowles. A page at the Queen's coronation, he was now a lieutenant colonel with the household cavalry. Interviewed that day, he described Charles as a marvellous leader and a marvellous man. Very few knew that Bowley Hyde Manor, the Parker Bowles home a few minutes' drive from Highgrove, had been used for trysts between Charles and Camilla. In time, Camilla also made secret visits to Highgrove. It's important to remember that when she got married, Highgrove was Diana's home. I mean, Kensington Palace was her London base, but Highgrove was home. And uh, on the occasions I visited the house, it was her place. But I think as the marriage deteriorated and she knew that, that Highgrove was where her husband entertained Camilla Parker Bowles, obviously her views on the place changed. So that by the time she left, she metaphorically and pretty much literally um, shook the dust of it off her, off her shoes. Charles had bought Highgrove to be close to Camilla. It's near the Gloucestershire town of Tetbury with its centuries-old buildings. Despite its quaint charm, Diana never felt at ease in the area. It was too near Camilla and the Beaufort Hunt. At this time, Diana didn't ride, and she was suspicious of the hunting set who might provide opportunities for Charles to see Camilla. Once when she was having lunch, the hunt sort of came galloping through the garden, the local hunt, the Beaufort, and she was outraged because Prince Charles jumped up and left his lunch to get cold on the table and rushed out to sort of look at them, and she was furious. Charles also met Camilla at safe houses loaned by friends who encouraged his betrayal of Diana. They were photographed together at one of their secret locations, Glincellin House near Brecon, owned by friends in Camilla's circle. In 1986, the Parker Bowles family moved to Middlewick House, again close to Highgrove. Caught out by the press, Charles made a frantic escape hidden under a blanket. He also journeyed to love nests round the country. The locations included Garraby Hall in Yorkshire, home of the Earl and Countess of Halifax. Eaton Hall in Cheshire, home of Anne, Duchess of Westminster. And Northmore Farm, then the Suffolk home of the Van Cutsums. Florence in Tuscany was a shared passion. They visited a villa bought by King Edward VII for Alice Keppel. Here, they loved to paint. The couple visited Turkey in 1989. When these sneak pictures in the press failed to end the affair, Diana took action herself. Prince Charles really believed that he could manage his love life. He could keep Camilla in one compartment and Diane in the other. And he was appalled when he was invited by Lady Annabel Goldsmith to her house, Ormley Lodge, uh, to go to a birthday party to discover that Diana, who had also been invited, was actually going to come. Surprisingly, the Prince of Wales didn't expect you know, the princess to go, but, 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 but she did, and I went with both the Prince and Princess of Wales. And he was appalled at the thought that the two women in his life were actually going to meet. And all his worst nightmares came true. Camilla and Charles had nipped off together. They were having a private conversation downstairs away from the main party. Within about an hour or so, I was heard my voice being shouted from the, from the hallway, and it was, it was the princess. And she's rather distressed, and she said to me, Ken, I, I can't find the Prince of Wales. So I said, well, you know, there's not much I can do. But, you know, why? She said, well, you know, I, I can't see Camilla either. So there was a sort of 
a, a rather serious tone that came across, an expression came across her face. She said, will you come and help me find them? Finally, Diana cracked. She raced down the stairs. She confronted Camilla and said, leave my husband alone. Diana had control of that moment, and I think it must have been a wonderfully triumphant moment for her because it was the only time during all the time that she was married to Prince Charles that she was ever able to confront Camilla and tell her to keep off her husband. I think when we were on tour in Egypt, Diana told me about confronting Camilla Parker Bowles at, uh, at the Goldsmith party. And I mean, it didn't surprise me very much because uh, I knew the princess was a pretty feisty lady. And I was quite pleased uh, on her behalf that, that she was confronting somebody who she felt was a very unwelcome intrusion in her life. Diana privately nicknamed Camilla the Rottweiler. Camilla called her Barbie after the doll. Everyone in royal circles knew that Charles and Diana now lived separate lives. Charles played polo every summer, a hobby Diana disliked almost as much as hunting. In 1990, the prince broke his arm in a dangerous fall. Diana was with Charles when he left hospital, but this show was a deliberate smokescreen to conceal the true state of the marriage. They went home to Highgrove together, but Diana soon left its front door for London, and Camilla arrived by the back entrance to nurse the prince. The marriage entered a terminal stage, with Diana and Charles both using Highgrove at different times. Camilla took over every aspect of Charles's private life. She is a mother to Charles, she's a nanny, she's a nurse, she's a mistress, she's somebody who treats him as a little boy, which I think is what he wants half the time. I think she must be great in bed with him and looks after him in that department exceptionally well. This is a lady who just does everything for the Prince of Wales and doesn't actually ask for that much in return. To be fair, I don't think she's even asked him to marry her. In June 1992, a biography of Diana revealed her suicide attempts and an eating disorder caused by her anguish over Charles's closeness to Camilla. Her secret cooperation with author Andrew Morton betrayed her husband and the royal family. The couple were scarcely speaking as they performed their last foreign tour in Korea that November. Days later, the Prime Minister, John Major, made this historic announcement. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. 1993 began badly with Camilla Gate, a bugged, intimate phone call between Charles and Camilla. I can't bear a Sunday night without you. It's like that program, Stop a Week. I can't stop a week without you. Charles's advisers encouraged him to tell his version of events to biographer Jonathan Dimbleby. On television, he admitted adultery with Camilla she was exposed to public censure. Whenever there's a crisis, the royal family has one rule and one rule only, and that is don't do anything. And when the Camilla Gate tapes were published, when Andrew Morton's book exposing Charles's uh, long affair with Camilla was published, Prince Charles did nothing. He let her take care of affairs for herself. As a result, she was put under house arrest by the British press. She was uh, vilified in public. People threw bread rolls at her. And basically, he did nothing to protect her. Nobody was sent in by his team, his Prince Charles's team, to actually make uh, life more easy for her. She had to survive by herself. Diana also mapped out a route for her own survival. On the night of Charles's televised admission of adultery, she upstaged him by wearing one of her most daring dresses at a charity event. A year later, she bared her soul in a remarkable interview for the programme Panorama. She spoke of her illnesses, her despair and her feelings of failure as a wife. With calculated revenge, she blamed Camilla. Do you think Mrs Parker Bowles was a factor in the breakdown of your marriage? Well, there were three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Famously, Diana said that there were three in her marriage, uh, by which I guess she was referring to Camilla Parker Bowles. And 
Uh, it's a fair bet that if there had only been two in the marriage, um, then it would have been easier for those two to do what was, after all, their duty constitutionally, which was to stay married. I think that's sometimes forgotten, that that, uh, that fairy tale wedding in St. Paul's in 1981 was the Windsor dynasty's best bet for long-term survival. And the fact that that, that didn't work, uh, for whatever reason, whether it was Camilla Parker Bowles or anything else, um, is the gravest, uh, most dangerous threat to the long-term future of of the dynasty. Camilla and Andrew Parker Bowles were divorced in early 1995, a few months after Charles's admission of adultery. Andrew had been embarrassed by his longtime friend and fellow army officer. Camilla remained silent. When Camilla got divorced from Andrew Parker Bowles, the only reason that that happened was 100% Prince Charles's fault. It would never have happened if he hadn't humiliated Andrew Parker Bowles by going on television. He admitted that he'd been unfaithful. Three days later, it was as quick as that, Andrew then said, a divorce has to go ahead. In fact, he behaved very well. He became the guilty party. It was very old-fashioned, and he took all the blame, and I think she divorced him. But that would never have happened if the Prince of Wales hadn't made that ridiculous admission to Dimbleby. Not only did it cuckold him in front of everybody, but it also was a fellow brother officer in one of the regiments saying, I have been having an affair with a fellow officer's wife. That is an absolute no-no in the British Army. You do not behave like that. Andrew, who had retired from the army on a pension, remarried. His second wife, Rose, took Camilla's place at society events, such as Ascot, each summer. The divorce cleared the way for Camilla's second marriage. Charles, who'd been having this wonderfully illicit affair, which went on for years and years and years, was in the position where he had to make an honest woman out of Camilla. Now, it may be that after all these years they've been together, he was actually tiring of her. And we may see that today that they live in Clarence House, but se living separate lives. Who knows? But what I do know is uh, that Charles forced uh, this divorce and he ended up with Camilla whether he wanted her or not. Camilla's children, Tom and Laura, were affected by their mother's affair with Prince Charles. Tom was so embarrassed by other boys teasing that at one stage he changed his surname to Bowles. He also turned to drugs and was caught out amid unrestrained publicity. Charles had to distance himself and his boys from his lover's son. One of the great disasters of the Camilla campaign, the, the campaign to try and make her more acceptable to the British public, was to try and join together the Parker Bowles family and the House of Windsor family, the, the children of uh, Camilla and the children of uh, Prince Charles. And uh, the spin doctors were trying terribly hard uh, to make this look like one nuclear family. But in fact, it was never going to work. Uh, Prince William and Prince Harry are remarkably suspicious of the whole Parker Bowles ethos, and uh, they wanted to maintain their distance. Parker Bowles is a valuable brand name. Tom, who once sold wax jackets in Harrods, has reinvented himself as a cookery writer. Charles and Camilla's friend Emily van Kutzum fell out with them over Tom's influence on the young princes. The feud was exposed when her son Edward married Lady Tamara Grosvenor, daughter of the Duke of Westminster. Two or three years previously, the van Kutzums had, at a dinner, had warned Prince Charles that the boys um, were mixing with Tom Parker Bowles, Camilla's son, who had been taking drugs, and they said, you know, he's a bad influence. When that dinner table conversation got back to Camilla, she struck back by making comments about the Van Cutsum children. The presence of the Queen added the aura of royalty and the rigidity of protocol. 
With her status defined by her role as a mistress, Camilla had to be seated away from the royal family. She knew that she wouldn't be sitting with Charles, but when she read in the papers, nobody had had the courtesy to tell her this, that she was not only not going to be sitting with Charles, but she'd be sitting over the other side of the church, somewhere at the back, I think she felt a bit peaked. We've got a royal mistress whose status and, and position is still very ambivalent. Uh, and of course the whole, the whole pond is made muddier because there are so many people stirring away in it. Charles faced a dilemma. If he attended, Camilla would be effectively snubbed. If he stayed away, he could be accused of letting down the bridal couple and their families. It became the war of the wedding, and Camilla won. For the first time since I can almost remember, the Prince of Wales actually stood up and got counted and showed some real fighting venom in favour of Camilla. And for the first time, Charles said, obviously, fine, I don't like this either. I'm going to find a good reason not to go to this wedding. Charles seems to have learnt nothing in the, the sphere of public relations. He doesn't know about damage limitation. He doesn't know how to uh, see a problem that's coming down the road and take avoiding action. And in the Van Cutsen wedding, we see um, a royal piece of machinery which doesn't work. During the Queen's Golden Jubilee celebrations in 2002, an open-air pop concert was held in the grounds of Buckingham Palace. Most members of the royal family attended. In the row behind the princes, Camilla sat with her friends Angus Ogilvie and his wife Princess Alexandra, the Queen's cousin. When Angus sadly died of cancer in 2004, Camilla was not allowed to be near the royal family at his funeral. Things were different in King Edward VII's day. Most of the aristocracy knew about Alice Keppel, but the public were kept in ignorance. Her identity was not disclosed by the deferential press of the time. The British press still kept a king's secrets in 1936. Edward VIII's romance with twice-divorced Wallace Simpson was unknown until he abdicated and they went into exile. But the world knew too much about Camilla's role in the breakdown of Charles's marriage to let her be forgotten. The problem is that he now cannot dump or ditch Camilla because he's gone too far down the Camilla road to have made all that unhappiness and created so much misery for the monarchy, for Diana, for his children, for everybody, for her sake. He now has to stick with her. It's almost like Edward and Mrs. Simpson back in the 1930s. He couldn't drop her. I mean, he didn't appear to want to, but it's a situation whereby he's made his bed, he has to lie in it. It's almost like the famous saying uh, that, you know, when you marry the mistress, you create a vacancy. And I've always felt that Prince Charles was a natural bachelor. I remember the days before he was married, and I thought, he doesn't need a wife. He's got housekeepers galore, he's got valets, he's got, you know, butlers, he's got everything that a normal man needs to run his household. A wife was just an accessory. What he really needed was a mistress. Another contender for that role was blonde Australian-born Lady Tryon, married to another of Charles's friends. Nicknamed Kanga by Charles, she ran a smart dress shop in London. She was injured in a fall and confined to a wheelchair and died shortly after Diana in 1997. Before her death, she recalled her friendship with Charles. Just because he happens to be Prince of Wales doesn't mean he's any different from lots of other friends. And I love my friends uh, and I love him a lot. But this very different thing, um, saying you're in love with someone, than that you love them and my friends have been a, a wonderful, wonderful support. After their parents' separation, William and Harry were given a young nanny, Tiggy Leg Burke, a daughter of a courtier. Her family were respected Welsh landowners and Charles often stayed on the family's Glanusk estate. Both Diana and Camilla were jealous of Tiggy's easy relationship with Charles. This led to rumours that despite his reliance on Camilla, Charles still had a roving eye. Camilla seems to be 
the kind of nanny that he had when he was a small boy and that nurtured him and the person he ran to when he was upset. And she sort of replaced the mother that he never really had because his mother was too busy running the country or reigning. And I think he's now old enough to feel a bit trapped by that. He has had friendships, friendships in inverted commas, with other ladies. And uh, maybe they were when Camilla wasn't available, who knows, but he certainly has had other friendships. And perhaps he thought, well, you know, if I were a free agent, I'd be able to have a little bit more fun. Camilla, Camilla, how do you feel in Chile? Camilla's reputation preceded her. When her old friend Lucia Santa Cruz invited her to a home in Chile, Camilla received the frenzied paparazzi treatment once endured by Diana. There is a profit in pictures of Camilla, and those who take them sometimes get closer than she would wish. The strain on her was evident, but by taking bodyguards paid by Charles to protect her, Camilla will avoid this ordeal in future. Being the prince's companion meant that she was never really free from press attention, even on a night out at the London Ritz with her elderly father, Major Bruce Shand. Sometimes she welcomed organized publicity as part of the strategy to gain public acceptance. But eating a sausage could be risky for the image if there was a photographer around. I think the British press love to have a bit of a laugh at Camilla. She doesn't quite have it. They have a wonderful time uh, making jokes about how she doesn't quite carry it off. Camilla feels at ease with the hunting set, which Diana disliked. She's at her most confident on horseback and can even joke with the press. Hello. <laughs> Do the press treat her well? I don't think Camilla gets a particularly fair press, but once she came into that firing line, she's always going to get shot at. I mean, it's a bit of a nightmare for any woman, least of all um, Camilla, to be permanently compared on the looks front with Diana, I mean, most women, even supermodels, sort of suffered a bit when, in comparison to Diana, you know, I don't think that worries Camilla particularly. I don't think it worries Charles. I think Charles has always found Camilla infinitely more attractive to behold than Diana. OK, very strange, but love is blind, isn't it? Hunting, a country pursuit she shares with Charles, is one of the passions which unite them. However beautiful and accomplished an ambassador for Britain, Diana could not retain her husband's love. Charles preferred the woman who presented no threat to his fragile ego. His wife was simply too popular. But were the underlying cultural differences between Charles and Diana too wide? Diana was a town girl, married to a countryman, and although she had lots of friends and she grew up in Norfolk, and Northamptonshire. She wasn't really a part of that polo-loving hunting group. She did not like horses or horse riding, and she resented the time it took Prince Charles away from her, but also, I think, because she suspected that he was using the hunt to, as an excuse to meet Camilla. William and Harry had to cope with the complexity of their parents' separation and divorce, and with the adverse publicity surrounding it. After their mother's untimely death, Camilla became part of their lives. I think Harry, more than William, has been really upset by the fact that Camilla walked in and took over Diana's home, Diana's man, Diana's lifestyle, Diana's everything. She stepped straight into a dead woman's shoes. And Harry, who was perhaps, you know, the baby of the family, much closer to his mother than William, he bitterly resents that. Prince William seems to be very diplomatic and very conciliatory. Uh, he knows his father's had a rough time and he seems to think, well, if it makes you happy, Dad, fine. Because remember, William hasn't really been around very much at home. He's been away at university for the last four years, more or less. So 
he hasn't had to put up much with Camilla. It's been worse for Prince Harry, who seems very unforgiving and not ready to, to accept Camilla in his life whatsoever. They have always felt uncomfortable in her presence, and it is significant that although they moved into Clarence House uh, as part of the so-called nuclear family of the House of Wales, they've moved back into their old apartments at St James's Palace. They just don't want to be close to Camilla. The couple considered marrying in Scotland to sidestep any difficulties presented by the Church of England, of which Charles will be supreme governor. Charles's divorced sister Anne married Tim Lawrence at Balmoral under easier Church of Scotland rules in 1992. For Charles, a compromise was reached. The church has had a very significant role in forcing Charles's hand in marriage. Uh, they have been very uncomfortable for a long time to see Charles and Camilla uh, living as they see it in sin. The difficulty they faced is that the church has split over this. Uh, the evangelical side of it um, uh, really believes that Charles is beyond the pale and can never really hold any responsible role within the Church of England, and so they don't want to see a marriage at all. The pragmatist side of the, of the uh, Church of England wants to see this problem solved, and in the end it was the pragmatists who won. Camilla was carefully positioned during the Jubilee Pop concert in Buckingham Palace Gardens. Not allowed to sit beside Charles and his sons, she was kept well away from the Queen, who simply ignored her. I've no idea what the Queen thinks of Camilla Parker Bowles, and very, very few people do have an accurate idea of what the Queen thinks of Camilla Parker Bowles. Uh, I think it's quite eloquent that the Queen has obviously been at some pains to distance herself from uh, the Prince's mistress, despite complicated and expensive attempts by the Prince to, to uh, manipulate the media in Camilla's favour. Um, people don't yet regard her as uh, somebody they want to see on the balcony of Buckingham Palace one day. Uh, they may never think that, that uh, she's a suitable person to do that. And until then, I'm sure the Queen is wise to um, uh, leave her own views um, tantalizingly unspecific. As Head of State and Supreme Governor of the Church of England, the Queen is always conscious of the example she sets. For years she has kept a delicate balance, knowing that Charles's adultery with Camilla could easily impact on her own standing and popularity. For this reason, she avoided confronting the Camilla issue. The Queen has her own thoughts on this. She has a constituency she has to answer to, the right-minded people of this country, people who believe in morality and, uh, and not in adultery, uh, people who she wants to represent. She wants to put distance between herself and Camilla because she has her eye on history. She uh, believes that she is now contending with Queen Victoria to be the great sovereign of this nation, and she doesn't want anything to taint that history when it is written. And certainly by involving herself with Camilla Parker Bowles, it can only be a downside. So the Queen will always maintain a very large distance between herself and Camilla. Charles told the Queen that Camilla is the one non-negotiable area of his life. He made public appearances with Camilla, which put the Queen in a difficult position. We can see over the period of the last three or four years that she's been snookered more than once. Uh, she has been pushed by Prince Charles and his uh, courtiers into doing things that she would prefer not to do. The Queen does not accept Camilla Parker Bowles and that is a problem for the future. The plan is for Camilla to be Her Royal Highness the Duchess of Cornwall while the Queen is alive and princess consort when Charles becomes king. This is an apparent contravention of English law, but it leaves the door open for her to become a queen consort. While Charles is living with Camilla and they're married in all but name, that doesn't seem to matter much to people, to the, to the British public at large anyway. They sort of think, oh well, he deserves a bit of happiness. But at the same time, if you question them and say, would you like Camilla to be queen, they get horrified. The fact is that she's automatically queen, that's it. That's the law of the land here, that a woman takes on the rights and titles of her husband. Edward VIII was forced to choose between the throne and Wallace Simpson. 
His Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, warned him, in the choice of a queen, the voice of the people must be heard. He chose abdication and married Mrs. Simpson at the Chateau de Condé in France, but she was denied the title Her Royal Highness. As Duke and Duchess of Windsor, they spent the rest of their lives in exile. Charles has pursued a high-risk strategy to keep the throne and the woman he loves. The divorced and widowed prince looks poignantly alone on his solo engagements. He will be happier with Camilla at his side, but could her presence damage the monarchy which still depends on public acceptance in Britain and in the Commonwealth countries? Speculation will continue over the constitutional problems raised by the royal marriage. Reactions to Camilla show divisions of national opinion. Some feel that Charles has put Camilla before his duty and should surrender his rights to the throne. The Queen, too, is concerned over Charles's ability to ensure the survival of the monarchy. She believes that the monarchy is only as strong as the weakest link. And right now, Prince Charles certainly looks like the weakest link. He seems to have sacrificed everything. I mean, at one stage, we all thought, you can have either Camilla or the crown, but you can't have both. Well, he sort of said, no, nope, I am, I'm going to have both. The long shadow of Diana reaches over Charles and Camilla's marriage. Will they ever be allowed to forget the fairy tale wedding that ended in misery and tragedy? I think the great British public are ready to forget, and they're probably not ready to forgive. And so they will always eye Camilla with slight suspicion, uh, a lingering disregard. She will never be a darling of the people like Diana was. There's too much against her. But at the same time, I think everybody realizes that this marriage had to occur. Their position had to be regularized. And it's a good opportunity for a brand new start. The newly engaged Camilla posed with Charles at Windsor Castle, wearing a half million pound diamond ring from the late Queen Mother's collection. How are you feeling, ma'am? Um, all right. Just all right. I'm just, like, I'm just coming down to work. Did he get down on one knee to propose? Of course. Yeah. Certainly not. Are you very happy, sir? Um, Are you very happy? Um, um, <laughs> this is the unlikely story of a woman who won a prince against all odds. Now she has a harder task ahead. Winning the hearts of the people will not be as easy.